Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the UPSC perspective. Today we have taken up important articles from the Hindu newspaper. Topics which we are going to discuss are displayed on your screen. Let's begin the discussion. Now here there is an important announcement for you all that optional batches for geography, PSIR and economy will start from 28th July 2023. So register yourself to avail first five classes for free using the link given in the description box. Also, join open orientation on 24th, 25th and 26th July for the respective optional from 3.30 to 5.30 pm. Also, these optional subjects are available offline at our Bangalore Centre and can be subscribed online from any location. So now let's start with our discussion. Now our first discussion is based on this article which appeared in Indian Express dated 18 July 2023. Context of this article is that Law Commission of India has initiated fresh deliberation on a uniform civil code which has triggered discussions on the institution of Hindu undivided family and its separate treatment under tax laws. Perhaps the most important question before the government would be whether UCC reforms would include the abolition of Hindu undivided family as a tax exempt category. Now here, you must be curious to know about what is Hindu undivided family. Hindu undivided family as a concept arises out of Hindu joint family system as family property is held by the head or karta of the family. Therefore, a separate tax structure has been created to recognize Hindu undivided family as a legal tax entity which does not exist in any other religion. So what does it mean? That it allows Hindu taxpayers to claim certain benefits. So if uniform civil code is considered, then this beneficial tax treatment will be scrutinized on grounds of equality before tax law and uniformity in application across religions. So this again illuminate the uniform civil code, its relevance and its shortcomings of personal laws and its impact on minorities in India. And you should know that uniform civil code is important theme under GS paper 2. So in this discussion we'll see what is uniform civil code, then we'll see historical background of uniform civil code, then we'll understand why we need uniform civil code, then we'll also try to understand what are the implementation hurdles with respect to uniform civil code and we'll end our discussion with a conclusion. So now let's start with uniform civil code. Now to understand this, you should imagine that when we were in school, we were having friends from various different faiths. Have we ever thought that at the time when they are marrying, they will be registering their marriage under different personal law of their respective faiths? For example, Christian Marriage Act 1872, Hindu Marriage Act 1955, Muslim Personal Law, Sharia Application Act 1937, etc. Now, the question is that why we can't have one uniform civil code for all citizens of India? Uniform civil code in India aims to formulate and implement personal laws of citizens which apply to all citizens equally, regardless of their religion, sex, gender and sexual orientation. And also you know that Uniform Civil Code is mentioned in Article 44 in the DPSP and it is found in Part 4 of the Indian Constitution, which states that the state shall endeavour to secure for the citizens a uniform civil code throughout the territory of India. And here I like to emphasize that constitution explicitly states that the state can only endeavor to achieve a common code among its citizens rather than enforce it because judiciary cannot enforce uniform civil code as it is not a part of fundamental rights, it is a part of DPSP. So what is the crux of Uniform Civil Code? That it is a proposal to replace the personal laws which are based on the scriptures and customs of each major religious community in the country with a common set of laws governing every citizen. These laws are distinguished from public law and cover marriage, divorce, inheritance, adoption and maintenance. Now let's delve much deeper into this topic and let's explore its historical background. Now the concept of Uniform Civil Code 
has its roots in colonial India. The British government, in an attempt to streamline the administration of justice, had introduced the Uniform Criminal Court. However, they allowed religious communities to retain their personal laws in matters of marriage, divorce, inheritance, and other personal affairs, primarily to avoid any potential social religious unrest. Now, later, the idea of uniform civil code was first introduced to the Indian public discourse during the drafting of the Indian Constitution in the late 1940s. The Constituent Assembly debates saw division of opinion on this issue. Some members of the Constituent Assembly, including Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, believed that a uniform civil code was necessary to promote gender equality, secularism, and national integration. However, many other members, including Najruddin Ahmed, were against it, claiming that the religious laws of different communities should not be tempered with without their consent. So this is all about historical background of Uniform Civil Code. Now, let us understand why we need Uniform Civil Code. First reason is that it provides equal status to all citizens irrespective of their religion, class, caste, gender, etc. It promotes gender parity as typically men are given preference in matters of succession and inheritance. So now here, for example, it adheres to the principle of Article 14, that is equality before law. Article 14 of the Indian Constitution guarantees that no person shall be denied the right to equality before law or the equal protection of law in the territory of India. Let's understand this with the help of example. For instance, Muslim personal law allows men to have up to four wives and to divorce their wives unilaterally through the practice of triple talaq. Although the latter has been recently outlawed, similarly, Hindu personal law traditionally favored marriages in matters of inheritance. Although reforms have been made to grant equal inheritance rights to daughters. So in crux, these gender biases and personal laws not only perpetuate gender inequality but also lead to legal complexities and inconsistencies. For example, a woman's right to maintenance after divorce can vary significantly depending on their religious affiliation. So basically, UCC could rectify these biases by providing a uniform set of laws that ensure equal rights and protections for men and women. Next is, it accommodates the aspirations of the young population, principle of modernity and reform existing personal laws. Let's understand this through various Supreme Court judgments. Observe the need for reformation of existing personal laws First thing this is Shah Banu case 1985. In this, Supreme Court upheld the right of a Muslim woman to claim maintenance from her husband even after that period. Second another such case is Sarla Mudgal case 1995. In this, Supreme Court stated that a Hindu husband cannot convert to Islam and marry without dissolving his first marriage. In this, Supreme Court called on the government to implement Uniform Civil Court. Another such case is Daniel Latifi case 2001. In this court held that Muslim women are entitled to claim maintenance from their husbands even if they are divorced under Muslim personal laws. So why we need UCC? To reform existing personal laws. Now, another objective is that it will promote national integration with the same set of personal laws for every citizen, thus reducing the scope of politicization of issues of discrimination, concessions or special privileges and reducing the vote back politics. Another one is that it will promote secularism and neutrality and the best example is Goa which is at present the only state in India with a uniform civil code. It follows Portuguese Civil Code 1867, which means that people of all religions in Goa are subject to the same laws on marriage, divorce 
and succession. The Goa, Daman and Dio Administration Act of 1962, which was passed after Goa, joined the Union as a territory in 1961, gave Goa permission to apply civil court. So Goa sets a very good example to have uniform civil court. Also, on global front, many Western countries have implemented a form of uniform civil court. For instance, France has a civil court often referred to as Napoleonic court, which serves as the foundation of private law in France. So these Western civil courts, like proposed uniform civil court in India, aims to provide a uniform legal framework that applies to all citizens, regardless of their religious or cultural affiliations. However, it is important to note that these countries have significantly less religious and cultural diversity compared to India, which obviously makes the implementation of a uniform civil court a more complex issue in Indian context. Now let's come to the last one, that is to accommodate the aspirations of young population. Contemporary, India is a totally new society with 55% of its population below 25 years of age. So their social attitudes and aspirations are shaped by universal and global principles of equality, humanity and modernity. It is a crucial parameter to harness the potential of demographic dividend. So this is all about why we need uniform civil code. First to set equality before law, then to promote national integration, then to reform existing personal laws, then to promote secularism, and then to accommodate aspirations of young population to harness the potential of demographic dividend. Now, you might be thinking that if it is this much important, then why it is not implemented till now? So here, Let's try to understand the other side of this particular issue, that is the implementation hurdles. Now, the implementation of code has been very difficult. Why? Because as you know that India is a diverse country with various religious communities following their own personal laws. For instance, laws of succession for most religions are skewed towards the male children of an interstate person. The legal marriageable age for Muslim women is different from others. While some religious and customary personal laws permit polygamy and polyandry, others do not. Similarly, the grounds for divorce and alimony are different in various religious law. So this will pose a great challenge to the implementation of uniform civil code. Another one is lack of consensus on provisions of uniform civil code. See, just imagine that these personal laws has evolved over centuries and is deeply rooted in religious and cultural practices of the respective communities. So modifying these laws to create a uniform civil code is a complex task because that requires careful consideration of the religious sentiments and cultural practices of its community. For example, if you see divorce, different personal laws have different grounds and one common ground is desertion. Now here, there is a waiting period which is of two years for Christians, but for Hindus, it is seven years. So now if in proposed uniform civil code, what will be the waiting period, two or seven? So again, this will be a bone of contention. So like this, many issues are there. So there is a lack of consensus on the provisions of Uniform Civil Code. Another one is that implementation of Uniform Civil Code also violates fundamental rights guaranteed by the Constitution. As Constitution explicitly states that the state can only endeavor to achieve a common code among its citizens rather than enforce it. So the implementation of Uniform Civil Code also violates the fundamental rights guaranteed by the Constitution including Article 25, that is, freedom to profess and practice one's religion. And Article 29, that is, right to have a distinct culture. It also contradicts the provisions granted to states like Nagaland and Missouri. Furthermore, a contention is made regarding the inconsistency of applying the principle of one nation, one law to personal laws of communities, given that codified civil laws and criminal laws such as CRPC and IPC do not adhere to this principle. For example, the variation in the law of 
anticipatory bail is evident across different states. So there is inconsistency of applying principle of one nation and one law. Furthermore, it goes against the spirit of federalism as personal laws are placed in concurrent list that is schedule 7 entry 5. So this goes against the spirit of federalism. And even some constitutional law experts argue that perhaps the framers did not intend total uniformity and that is why personal laws were placed in entry 5 of concurrent list with the power to legislate being given to the parliament as well as state assemblies. Last but not the least, as far as the protection of human rights or social obligations is concerned, the nation has laid down bottom line policies through general laws. For instance, there is a general law that prohibits child marriage and reigns over all personal laws. So there is no need to twist and turn personal laws for the protection of human rights or social obligations. So these are the different implementation hurdles which we have with respect to Uniform Civil Code. Now having seen the arguments in favour of Uniform Civil Code and against Uniform Civil Code. Now in conclusion, the debate surrounding the Uniform Civil Code is complex and multifaceted involving political, religious and cultural dimensions. While UCC has the potential to promote gender justice and national unity, it also raises concerns about religious freedom, cultural diversity and the rights of minority communities. So the challenge lies in finding a balance between these competing interests and ensuring that the UCC, if implemented, is inclusive, equitable and respectful of India's diverse cultural and religious landscape. Even 21st Law Commission emphasized the importance of reforming family laws across various religions to ensure gender equity rather than solely focusing on the enactment of Uniform Civil Code. In 21st Law Commission exhibited a strong inclination towards prioritizing gender equality within communities as opposed to pursuing equality between communities. Now many nations are currently transitioning towards acknowledging and accepting diversity. So it is important to note that mere presence of diversity does not necessarily indicate discrimination. Rather, signifies a thriving democratic society. That's all with respect to Uniform Civil Code. Now our next discussion is based on this article which appeared on page number 3 in the Hindu newspaper dated 23rd July 2023. Context of this article is that four Tihar jail officials have been suspended for the security lapse on Friday when the Kashmiri separatist leader Yasin Malik who is currently serving life sentence in the high security prison after conviction in a terror funding case was spotted inside the Supreme Court. Now, as you know, prison reforms is an important aspect under governance, transparency and accountability, which is important theme under GS Paper 2. So let's begin our discussion with prison reforms. So let's understand about prison administration in India. Now, prison is a state subject under list second of the seventh schedule to the Constitution of India. So what does it mean? That the management and administration of prisons falls exclusively in the domain of state governments and is governed by the Prisons Act 1894 and prison manuals of the respective state governments. Also, you should remember that it is an important component of the criminal justice system in India. So here, one may get the doubt that then what are the other components of criminal justice system? So there are four of them. First is legislature that's by parliament. Second is enforcement that is done by police. Then third is adjudication for that we have courts. And the last is corrections and for that we have prisons, community facilities etc. Now let us understand what is the need for prison reforms in India. Prison reform is necessary to ensure that human rights of prisoners are protected and their prospects for social reintegration are increased. Why? Because prisons are not isolated from the society and prison health is public health. The vast majority of people committed to prison eventually return to wider society. Thus, it is not in vain that prisons have been referred to as reservoirs of disease 
in various contexts. Thereby, their physical and mental health has to be taken into consideration. Further, in Brahma Murthy v. State of Karnataka 1997 case, Supreme Court identified nine issues concerning prisons, such as overcrowding, trials being delayed, the torture and ill treatment of prisoners, neglect of health and hygiene, insubstantial food and inadequate clothing. So now, let us understand these issues in detail. So the first issue is under trial prisoners. Under trial are those who are waiting to appear in court after being charged with a crime. Because their guilt has not been established, they cannot be considered guilty. So according to the latest available data compiled by National Crime Records Bureau that is NCRB for year 2020, about 76% of all prison inmates in the country were under trials, of which 68% were either illiterate or school dropouts. Among the under trials, 20% were Muslims, while about 73% were Dalits, tribals or OBCs. And most of them are poor and illiterate. They are unable to furnish bail for their release and not made aware about their legal rights. That is right to bail, right to free legal aid. Second problem is colonial legislation. Now why this is an issue? Because prisons in India are still governed by Prisons Act 1894 and currently we are living in 2023. So basically a colonial legislation which treat prisoners as subpar citizens is guiding our prisons. So why this is an issue? Because it provides legal justification for retributive punishment. Now what is this retributive punishment? It is a form of punishment that is based on the principle of justice that those who commit wrongdoing should receive punishment proportionate to the severity of their offense. So basically, it is often associated with concept of an eye for an eye. So Prisons Act 1894 provides legal justification for retributive punishment as opposed to rehabilitative punishment. Now what is rehabilitative punishment? It is an approach to punishment that focuses on the rehabilitation and reform of offenders with the goal of helping them reintegrate into society as a law-abiding citizens. Also, this act is highly casteous and has not changed much since the British drafted it. For example, some jail manuals continue to focus on purity as prescribed by the caste system and assign work in prison based on prisoners' caste and identity. Next problem is torture and abuse. Now prisoners are subjected to the harshest form of torture and made to perform heavy labor for no pay. Also, the number of people dying in custody as a result of abuse and torture has been steadily rising. Above that, prisoners who are women are more vulnerable to abuse. Next problem is overcrowding and lack of basic facilities. Now, most of the jails in India are overcrowded and lack basic facilities. Now, as per the latest data of National Crime Records Bureau, over 5.5 lakh prisoners are lodged in Indian jails against a prisoner lodging capacity of 4.4 lakh. Also, most Indian prisoners were built in colonial era and are in constant need of repair and part of them are uninhabitable for long periods. Next is neglect of basic requirements. Basically, the conditions for prisoners in India are extremely unsanitary. There are inadequate medical facilities and the diet has not changed in years. Another issue is many prisons in India are understaffed, which can lead to poor conditions and lack of security. Now, according to the findings of Indian Justice Report 2019, this is an initiative of Tata Trust. According to it, Indian prisons are understaffed by at least 33% with the highest vacancies found at the officer and correctional staff levels. So what is the impact of this? 
This has increased the workload of the staff and is having an impact on the correctional aspect of imprisonment leading to poor conditions and lack of security. Next challenge is imprisonment and poverty. How? Because imprisonment disproportionately affects individuals and families living in poverty. When an income generating member of the family is imprisoned and the rest of the family must adjust to this loss of income. Even when released, often with no prospects of employment, former prisoners are generally subject to socio-economic exclusion and are thus vulnerable to an endless cycle of poverty, marginalization, criminality and imprisonment. Thus, imprisonment contributes directly to the impoverishment of the prisoner and his family with a significant cross-generational effect. Now, what is cross-generational effect? It refers to the impact or influence that one generation has on other, often within the context of cultural, societal or familial dynamics. So, this is the positive side of generational effect. On the other hand, negative generational effects can occur when harmful behaviors, beliefs or traumas are transmitted from one generation to another. It's better to understand this with the help of example. That for instance, negative attitude or biases held by one generation can be passed down and perpetuated in younger generations. So what will happen? This will lead to societal challenges such as discrimination, prejudice, or intolerance. Half of the crime in our society is because of this cross-generational effect. So imprisonment and poverty is leading to significant cross-generational effect of society by creating future victims and reducing future potential economic performance. So these are the issues related to prison administration in India. Now, having seen challenges related to prison administration in India, let's have a look on some of the United Nations standards and norms that relate directly to prison reforms. So, these are norms related to prison reforms. And among all these, one of the important convenient is Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Why? Because it provides some basic principles of administration of justice. Like, no one should be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Second is, everyone has the right to life, liberty and security of person. Third one is, no one shall be subjected to arbitrary arrest, detention or exile. Fourth one is, everyone charged with a penal offence has the right to be presumed innocent until proved guilty according to law in a public trial at which he has all the guarantees necessary for his defense. So as we have seen UN convenants related to prison reforms, we also should know the two most important articles of our constitution relevant in this regard. First is Article 39A. Now what does Article 39A? It provides that state is required to offer free legal aid to accuse inmates both inside and outside of prison who are unable to hire a lawyer because they lack the resources to defend themselves in court against the allegations leveled against them. Second important article is Article 21. Now, Supreme Court has ruled in several cases that Article 21 of the Constitution covers the right to medical care in addition to guaranteeing right to personal liberty. So, Article 21 of the Constitution forbids any inhuman, cruel or degrading treatment of anyone whether they are citizen or foreigner. So, these are the important articles related to prison reforms. Now, having seen the challenges associated with prison reforms, now let's understand various recommendations on prison reforms by multiple committees and way forward. First in this is All India Prison Service. Now, All India Committee on Jail Reforms, 1980-1983. to 1983. This is also known as Justice A.N. Mullah Committee. This committee recommended to develop an All India Prison Service as a professional career service 
with appropriate job requirements, sound training and proper promotional avenues. Second suggestion is National Prison Commission and Open Prisons. Same committee, that is Justice A. N. Muller Committee, also suggested setting up a National Prison Commission as a containing body to bring out modernization of prisons in India. It also recommended the government to set up and develop open prisons in each state and duties and life convicts with good behavior to be transferred to semi-open and open prisons. So here, I think you should understand what is open prisons. Open prisons have relatively less stringent rules as compared to control jails. So open prisons, fundamental rule is that it has minimal security. Next suggestion is to have special fast track courts. And this was recommended by Justice Amitwa Roy Committee, which was set up in year 2018 by the Supreme Court. For what? To deal exclusively with petty offences, which have been pending for more than five years. Next is personal recognition bond. First, this bond was recommended by same Justice Amitwa Roy Committee, and it advocated for the release of accused on an PR bond. That is, if they are charged with minor offences and granted bail, but are unable to secure security. Next suggestion is establishment of research and development wing. This was recommended by Draft National Policy on Prison Reforms and Correctional Administration 2007. Next suggestion is gender parity in police force. And this was recommended by Justice Krishna Iyer Committee, which was set up in year 1987. So what this committee recommended, it recommended induction of more women in the police force in view of the special role in tackling women and child offenders. Last but not the least is Model Prison Manual 2016. Union Home Ministry have developed the Model Prison Manual 2016 in alignment with UN resolutions. So all states must implement it in its letter and spirit. So these are all recommendations on prison reforms. Though there are various steps taken by government for prison reforms in India, like e-prison project, which provides a centralized approach for recording and managing prisoner information and generating different kinds of reports. Another is web application launched by the National Legal Service Authority to provide the under trial prisoners with free legal services. So these are few initiatives, but much more distance we need to cover for making watershed reforms in this regard. So for this, the approach toward prison reforms should be to rehabilitate and reform the inmates rather than reactive to avoid subjecting people to unnecessary trauma and confinement. And for this, state must make sure that prisons serve as a pathway for those who are not born criminals or criminals by nature to reintegrate into society. Our next discussion based on this article which appeared on page number 11 in the Indian Express dated 18 July 2023. The author of this article has discussed the very interesting idea of approval voting, which he calls many of the above, that is MOTA. He suggests that this electoral reform so as to enable the Indian political landscape to prevent unnatural political alliances. Now as we all know that there are two simultaneous political blocks are in making for the purpose on next general election. One under the leadership of Congress which claims support of 26 opposition political parties. Another political bloc is being forced by BJP, which claims to have brought about 30 political parties. Thus, according to the author, no one can make an honest case that the parties on either side of the ideological spectrum are natural alliance partners who are in perfect harmony with each other. While these meetings seemingly reflect ideological political formations, at their root, the primary driving force for such unity and alliance efforts is arithmetic. The aim is to ensure that votes of one formation do not get divided and the goal is to minimize splitting of votes on each side. And in this context, author suggests the alternative voting idea that is MOTA. Now, if you will refer to the GS paper to slippers 
Free and fair election and democratic value forms a part of basic structure which is important theme under GS paper 2. Also in this discussion we will dwell into different forms of electoral system which can further help you to put a comparison of the Indian constitutional scheme with that of other countries which is another important theme under GS paper 2. Further, if one looks into the UPSC PYQs, UPSC in year 2017 asked a question based on the theme of electoral reforms in 2016. So in this discussion, we will first try to understand the concept of approval voting that is MOTA. Then we'll see alternative forms of voting system. Then we will quickly look upon the question why India choose first past the post system that is FPTP. Then we'll see merits and demerits of FPTP and proportional representative system and we'll end our discussion with a way forward. So let's begin our discussion by understanding the concept of approval voting. Now, approval voting is an electoral method that lets voters choose or approve any number of candidates on the ballot. In elections, the most popular candidate with largest number of votes wins. Let us understand this with the help of an example. Suppose a voter in Uttar Pradesh has choices of four major parties that is Samajwadi Party, BJP, Bahujan Samaj Party and Congress and a few small parties such as Apna Dal and Rashtriya Lok Dal. Now voter is expected to choose just one among all these choices to cast their vote for. One may choose to vote for Apna Dal, which in turn may be ideological aligned with BJP. But a vote for Apna Dal is deemed as a vote denied for the BJP in the first past the post system. So it is tempting for the BJP to lure Apna Dal into a pre-poll alliance to ensure consolidation of such votes. Even though there is no guarantee that every Apna Dal voter will automatically transfer their vote to a BJP Apnadal Alliance. Now, what if voter in the UP was not forced to choose just one party to vote, but was free to choose as many parties as one wants to? This is the voter can choose both Apnadal and BJP. This means that a vote for Apnadal is not necessarily a vote denied for BJP, and an explicit alliance between the two parties is not needed since those who wish to vote for both are free to do so. This system called approval system or approval voting and it is a well-researched voting methodology that is used in elections with multiple credible choices such as in United Nations, internal party primaries in the US and sometimes in the election of Pope. The winner is determined by the candidate with the greatest numbers of approvals or tick marks. In the Indian context, we can think of approval voting as MOTA, which is the mirror image of MOTA that we already have on every ballot. So now having seen the approval voting system, now let's explore other forms of electoral system. Now the first one is proportional representation system. Proportional representation is the idea that the seats in parliament should be in proportion to the votes cast. Another one is ranked voting system. It is an electoral system in which voters rank candidates by preference on their ballots. If a candidate wins a majority of the first preference votes, he or she is declared the winner. Another one is score voting system. Score voting sometimes called range voting and it is a single winner voting system where voters rate candidates on a scale. The candidate with the highest rating wins. So the pertinent question that one should ask is why India opted for the first past the post system. So now let's talk about first past the post system which is also known as simple majority system. In this voting method, the candidate with the highest number of votes in a constituency is declared the winner. The system is used in India in direct elections to the Lok Sabha and state legislative assemblies. Why? The first reason is because of its simplicity. The reason for the popularity and success of FPTP system is its, its simplicity. The entire election system is extremely simple to understand even for common voters. 
who may have no specialized knowledge about politics and elections. There is also a clear choice presented to the voters at the time of elections. Voters have to simply endorse a candidate or a party while voting. Another feature is vastness and diversity of the country. The system of proportional representation, that is PR system, which we apply in the elections of Rajya Sabha is a complicated system, which may work in a small country, but would be difficult to work in a subcontinental country like India. So now just for reference, the first general election in India took around 7 to 8 months for completion of exercise. So now here you can imagine that what time it would have taken if a complicated system like that of PR would have been adopted. Next is that it ensures accountability. FPTP system offers voters a choice, not simply between parties, but specific candidates. In other electoral system, especially PR system, voters are often asked to choose a party and the representatives are elected on the basis of parties list. As a result, there is no one representative who represent and is responsible for one locality. So in a constituency based system like FPTP, the voters know who is their own representative and this can hold him or her accountable. So FPTP system ensures accountability. Further, more importantly, the makers of constitution also feel that PR based elections may not be suitable for giving a stable government in a parliamentary system, which is another important feature of FPTP system. See, the parliamentary system requires that the executive has majority in the legislature, but proportional representative system may not produce a clear majority because seats in the legislature would be divided on the basis of share of votes. But FPTP system generally gives the largest party or coalition some extra bonus seats, more than the share of votes would allow. Thus, this system makes it possible for parliamentary government to function smoothly and effectively by facilitating the formation of stable government. To understand this, take an example of coalition era of UPA government, which is also termed as era of policy paralysis. Situation was so worse that local regional parties were dictating the terms even in matters of international treaties, which otherwise must remain the exclusive domain of the central government. Point in case is the issue of land boundary with Bangladesh or India-Sri Lanka relations, which were being obstructed by the parties of West Bengal and Tamil Nadu respectively. And the last but not the least is that FPTV system facilitates convergence. See, FPTP system encourages voters from different social groups to come together to win an election in a locality. In a diverse country like India, a PR system would encourage each community to form its own nationwide party, thus representing their narrow interests which are decoupled from the larger interest, that is national interest. So these are the important factors based on which India opted for the first past the post system. Now having seen the benefits, let's also explore some challenges associated with FPTP system. The first is that it does not represent true mandate. The candidate does not need to have a majority. They just need to have more votes than others contesting the same seat. So if there are four strong candidates, with equal possibility of gaining representation, the votes are divided four way. The winner could be someone with, say, 26% of the votes. The other candidate who scored more than 20% do not have any chance of seeing the gates of Jilla Parishad or municipality, assembly or parliament. It is only fair to demand that the party should have representation in parliament or assembly according to their vote share. Now, having a sizable vote and not having representation in the house defeats the purpose of those voters who have cast a vote for their party. If the party loses, does it mean their votes are wasted? Such is the nature of this politics. 
that even notable leaders have faced defeat due to the communal divisions of votes under the FPTP system. Even the tallest leader of his times, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, couldn't see the doors of the Lok Sabha. Another challenge is bias in political fielding of candidates. Now, political parties put up candidates who do not alienate the majority of voters. Since Dalits, Adivasis and women candidates have only a long shot at winning, parties are discouraged to field candidates from minority groups outside the reserve seats. So there is a bias in political fielding of candidates. Because parties always try to put up candidates who do not alienate the majority of the voters. Another challenge is that it promotes backdoor dealings. Under such intense representation protocols, the vote share must be co-opted for one candidate to win. Thus, backdoor dealings are done without the poor voter having any idea about the fate of their vote. Last purpose of FPTP stands defeated. See, the purpose of FPTP was geared towards having a two-party system with minority small parties not being bothersome coalition partners. But Indian elections since 1952 have undergone massive social changes. This has contributed to each caste polity claiming its share, giving rise to coalition governments, thus going against the maximum of FPTP. So these are the important challenges with respect to FPTP system. Now having seen the merits and demerits of FPTP system, many scholars argue that India should shift from FPTP to proportional representative system. In this context, in India, groupings and political learnings are majorly based on ascriptive identities. That is community identity, which is based on birth and belonging for example, caste and religion, rather than on some form of acquired qualifications or accomplishments as is the case with countries like Norway, Finland or Belgium. For example, if there is a grouping which profess environmental conservation, its political actions would be mostly directed towards environmental issues, which is clearly not the case in present political landscape of India. Conversely, Smaller parties need to exist as rightful partners in India's electoral politics. However, due to the current system, they are forced to either get co-opted or aligned with the interests of national parties, defeating the purpose of federalism and local government. Thus, a method combining FPTP and proportional representation needs to be charted out for the health of India's republicanism. That's all for today. Stay tuned for more such updates.